morning, everyone. Uh, my name, again, my name is Lance Smith. I am the CEO of Primary Data. It's a real pleasure to be here today and have a chance to talk to you about how data virtualization will transform the enterprise. Really, it'll do this in real time. This is really an approach or a technology that will allow a data center to match the evolving needs of data and applications to the storage types. Also, at the end of the presentation, I have a demo for you. It's a short demo of a real-world situation, and actually take this data virtualization technology, put it to, uh, to use, and show the, uh, the power of this technology and how it can improve the data center. OK, I'm sure there's a number of you in the back of your mind thinking, what is data virtualization? This is a question that's been asked in the marketplace. It's got a lot of uh, um, activity in the, uh, in the press and in the news. So data virtualization, if we look at the technical definition, this is where a, uh, a technology actually can separate the application's logical view of its data or files from its physical location. Well, that's kind of academic and it's a, it's a very dry definition. I'd like us to actually use an analogy, something that um, is very tangible and affects our lives every day. What if we talk about the items that we own and how we store them? Well, it's, a, it's a very good analogy because we have a lot of different types of storage that we use around our house. You can imagine, we have uh, milk in our refrigerator, we have our toothbrush and our toothpaste in our bathrooms, and these are very accessible they, because we need them right away every day. But then there are those items we don't need so often. Maybe it's our bikes or it's um, our old books from, from college. We will store those, and you probably have a few closets that are sort of stuffed with these older items, or even a garage, as you can see in the picture here, that's actually filled. Well, what happens if you run out of room? Well, you have to back up the truck and start to figure out what other options you have for your storage. Well, there are a few in the marketplace. Some of us will actually go to public storage and go rent one of these uh, storage lockers. Now, these are quite nice because, in fact, they're, uh, they're scalable, it's you know, sizable. You can decide what uh, amount of space that you need. They're also somewhat convenient. You're actually able to go to these storage lockers pretty much any time that you want. But what happens when it starts to fill up? You start to forget about items that are sitting at the back of the storage unit. And then ultimately, you may have some valuable items that are sitting in a box that you have forgotten. Don't forget, you also have to get in a car, and it takes time for you to make use of this storage. Now, those items you might have forgotten happens all the time in the data world. It might be actually valuable. and There could be some reality show that ends up purchasing this locker, and all of a sudden you find your item up for sale. We don't want to have that. So there are other services that are in the world. We've got third-party services. Oh, let me back up. We've got third-party services where they'll actually deliver a storage pod to you. These are quite convenient. Again, they're very, you can size them, and you can adjust the capacity for based on what uh, size uh, storage pod that you want. We've seen these in the neighborhood. They get dropped, and they're super convenient. You can walk out from your house or your apartment. You can drop off the items in the storage. But then you have to schedule it. Could take days, could take weeks at times for you to actually make use of the storage. And it's def definitely cheaper than having to use one of the uh, public storage lockers. Now imagine, what if all of these different storage types and all of your personal items could be available when you want them. Here's an example. It's just past Thanksgiving. We're in the first week of December, and you want those box of Christmas decorations. What if, in the first week of December, they get delivered from your storage locker to your house, ready for you to decorate your Christmas tree? Or what if, at first snow, your ski or ski equipment shows up at your doorstep, so you're the first one out on the mountain enjoying that fresh powder. Or what if you go on vacation, you check into your hotel, there's your luggage, nicely packed with all of your clothes, you got your swimsuit ready to hit the beach. This is precisely what data virtualization is about. This is what it can actually deliver. The data in the right place at the right time. Now it also has one other big advantage. In, in, the, in the digital world, we can use one more analogy that gets us closer to what the IT uh, is feeling. Look at your digital content. What do you guys carry? You have a laptop full of uh, pictures and files. You have a phone that's got pictures, files, and uh, uh, music. 
You probably make use of social sites, store pictures. You probably make use of the iCloud for video. You probably also have a few USB sticks. Each one of these are convenient for what you need, when, and where you want it. Now, if we take a look at this environment, there's a wide plethora of storage types, a huge dynamic range that IT has to deal with. Because of this, you want to be able to have very high performance flash in a server. And what we've learned、uh, in the last couple of years with the advent of flash in a server is that we know we can get four to ten times more performance out of that application. Now, that's a huge benefit. But it's hard to use because it's very siloed. And then we have our shared storage, whether it's a NAS based storage or a SAN based storage. Those are also very useful, but they have different cost points. And then we have the cloud. This dynamic range goes from the very fast and expensive to the almost unlimited capacity in the cloud, but also much, much slower and much, much cheaper. With data virtualization, we automate. This technology allows us to automate data movement to put it into the right place at the right time. And it gives us another advantage. With this type of technology, it's storage agnostic, meaning you could use any type of storage, whether block or file or object, in your data center. You can also use any vendors, and you can mix vendors and mix vendor types at each different types of storage. Now, this is a huge advantage. And I'd like to say is that, well, quite frankly, this transforms the data center and fundamentally changes the data center economics. Now, let me say that again. It will change, fundamentally change, the data center economics. How? Today, IT, they don't run, want to run into a problem because the day they run into a problem, it's too late. They can't go out and procure more equipment. Deploy it into the data center and deal with that business application or that business need that arises or have some types of peak demand. What ends up happening is that they over provision. This is expensive. They'll over provision、uh, for performance. So there'll be extra capacity, drives running in parallel or storage running in parallel, so they can get more performance or simultaneous performance. They'll also over provision because the traditional architecture. Where they marry the compute resources with the storage resources to guarantee that performance, and then they'll instantiate that multiple times so that each one of those applications has the necessary storage performance to get the kind of application performance necessary for that business need. Let's take a look what it means to a business when you apply this technology. We've been out in the marketplace for quite some time now, and we've been actually interfacing with Fortune 500 companies and taking the、uh, data virtualization technology and applying it to their needs. There's a few pain points that they come back with, and I really wanted to share with you what those pain points look like. In the health services, we've gone to the top hospitals in the U.S., and one of the most common problems they have is the deluge of data from patients. Patients come in. They collect a lot of information about this patient's inf、uh, insurance information. They take X-rays. They take MRIs. They collect all of this information for those patients. Then, once the service is completed or the patient is cured, that data now sits in that silo that I talked about. You've got like maybe a virtual machine that、uh, is running that application with the data that's associated with it. The biggest pain point was that data is just sitting on their primary on-premise storage. Very expensive. And what they're trying to do is trying to figure out how do I take that data and put it into a lower cost, cheaper solution, but still have it readily available. Because after a year, a patient will come back; they want to have access to it. Or there'll be ongoing research at the hospital, and they want to look at the variety of of uh, uh, patients' uh, results and their and their、uh, and their data of what happened when they when they、uh, came into the hospital. This is a challenge because they don't want to delete data. So if you could take data and move it from any one of these different tiers, it's now very cost-effective in real time. It can be driven、uh, by time or usage. Let's go look at the next one. This one I like a lot. Hollywood.、We、go to the studios, and there was two major pain points that they talked to us about, where data mobility could solve their problems using data virtualization. First one. They're developing these movies, and they do a lot of、uh, frame rendering using CG models, 3D models, and they add all these nice special effects to the movies. They have multiple development sites where they're trying to develop these movies and these and rendering these frames 
around the clock, basically doing a follow the sun development strategy. And in a 24 hour period, they can have up to five different sites actually touching the data points and the artists rendering these things and sending the frames on to the next location. Most of them have to use replication and highly costly caching solutions on the edge to make this technology work for them. With data virtualization, we can just move that data as the day ends from one site to the next or when it's on demand. What I'm telling you is that you don't have to uh, duplicate the data for anything other than protection. You don't have to have six copies of it running in your data center, which forces you to have six times the capacity that you would normally need. Now, I said there was two problems. The second one is even, is even more interesting. What happens, they make that movie, it comes to the market, and it's a big blockbuster. Two to three years later, they make the decision to, to build a sequel. They want to go back and look at those 3D models. They want to take those rendered frames and sequences, and they want to use it into the next movie so there's good consistency. Many times they run into the problem, when they put it in the archival tier, it changes name, difficult for them to find it, and all of a sudden they have to re-render it and their costs go up and it takes them more time to come to market. In this case, the file's not being used, it would naturally migrate over into cheaper, low-cost, cold storage. Somebody uh, uh, wants to access it again without the application or the user knowing, it actually moves into the through the physical world, but it looks like it's the same location in the logical world. The last example I have for you is a global delivery service. Now, here's a tremendous amount of data that gets generated real time. Package comes from a seller, gets delivered to that uh, to the delivery service, they pick it up. What happens? Every time it gets touched and scanned, it generates a piece of data. A customer like myself, we want to see what's happening with that package. How long is it going to take to get delivered? Is it actually passing you know, from one state to the next or uh, internationally to make sure that it actually arrives safe safely? After that package arrives, the performance of the looking up where that package is, uh, you know, where it's at in its status, it drops off. But who's going to take that data and move it off a of primary storage that's very fast over into a, uh, a higher capacity, lower cost storage? Why would you do it? And this is where big data comes in. We have all this information about how packages are being delivered around the world. You can do post analytics on that information. You don't want it on your primary storage. You want to do it to try and help the business and improve your routes, reduce the cost of delivery, reduce uh, the, the time it takes to deliver a package, or see if there's any issues with maybe other carriers they might be using or methods of, of delivery. Let's move on to the demo. This is where I really want to show you um, how data virtualization and data mobility actually is in action and how it's very useful. But I'm going to log in real quick and set this up for you. Get a password in here. OK. This is our product's uh, single pane of glass interface. I want to set up essentially a company, uh, a, um, a scenario that's kind of real world. It is, uh, oh, well, look, this weekend is Mother's Day. So we thought it'd be a good idea to, to show a florist that is um, in the US really preparing to deal with uh, ordering of flowers or other products for Mother's Day and delivery. And this is the uh, IT environment that we've set up for this particular company. And they've got all kinds of functions that are occurring, actually. They've got, um, over on the left-hand side, there's a block that describes their database application for their front end online uh, services for, for customers wanting to make orders. Across the middle there's other applications that are running. Some of them are dev and test where IT is actually testing out specific different environments. You've got uh, back end ERP that's running. On the top it sort of gives you an idea of what's happening in the data center itself. Effectively it gives you the attributes of how the data center, how many files you're actually managing, how well we're doing data placement, how much is it costing you to manage uh, the data across the different types of storages. We also have heat maps. In the middle, actually, is a, uh, a heat map of the activity of files. So we have 762 million files, and we have uh, uh, tens and tens of terabytes worth of information that's actually active in this, currently in this data center. Now, I've asked engi our engineering to create a complete simulation, an emulation model that's right underneath. So we've got a number of clients that are active. We've got people who are logging in. We've got information that's being requested. What we'll do this, why don't we dive down into 
the application that's running the front end for the online request for um, uh, floral uh, purchases and deliveries. So what we've got here is uh, the floral application for the front end interface. Down at the bottom, you'll see a couple of bars. Those bars actually are the different tiers of storage for this application. We got two, we got one high performance tier, in the middle is a medium performance. These are various different files that we've determined based on its activity and related to the performance of the application, what this needs are. But there's also archival logs and backups. That's what's actually happening on the bottom. And you can see in the middle, we've got about 19 terabytes worth of active files. Now, what I've asked engineering to do, as you see in the upper right hand corner, we have a, uh, a load simulator button. And in the background, we actually have running on our server where we start activating uh, more customers. Right? So if you're thinking about Mother's Day, you're probably like myself saying in the next couple of days, you're going to pull out that iPhone and you're going to say, OK, I've got to order some flowers and send them off to mom. Everyone does this. This is where this peak demand shows up, where business needs are, are increasing and IT needs to react to it. Now with data virtualization, we should be able to, uh, with policy, automatically start to adjust for those needs for that application. And if I put the load simulator, what you're going to start seeing happening down at the bottom, there's some activity. We're going to get some growth in the, uh, the uh, database itself because people are making orders. We're also going to see that there's files that have actually moved from one tier to another. Now, we've increased the amount of data that's actually being managed from about 19 terabytes to 20 terabytes. Now, with the magic of demonstration software, this is something that might actually occur over hours, you know, maybe even a half a day, not really a few minutes, but only we have a couple of minutes that uh, we have for this demonstration. You'll see that uh, the number of IOPS have actually increased from about the 80s to about uh, 95,000 IOPS. So the system is responding perfectly. But we actually have a warning. Right in the middle of our screen here, it's telling us that resources um, used by this share are starting to run low. Let's, um, let's take a look at it. This is on the high performance tier itself. There's actually four applications that are running off of this uh, high performance tier. Now, this scenario is interesting because I said before, one of the ways that IT can respond to uh, ongoing demand or demand that's going to show up is, in fact, adding more equipment. We don't want to do that. This over-provisioning means that we have a lot of resources that are readily available or resources that are actually misplaced. We have four different applications that are running, and we've got one of them here that's actually a test and dev application. And if we take a look at it, it's actually got three different storage tiers that it's actually making use of. A high performance one, a medium performance one, and a slow performance. But our software, and in this data virtualization environment, we can see what activity is by file and by storage, and it's actually prioritized us and says, you know what, maybe uh, the Destin Tev group this weekend doesn't need the performance tier. We can actually select it and demote it off the performance tier. And you can see we've got about a terabyte worth of uh, information that's going to be moved into a medium tier. We apply that, and if you can see down at the bottom, our status screens are showing that we have more headroom on the performance tier. And we can also go back and take a look at overall to see that all of our applications are running in compliant with their service level objectives. That's the key thing about this solution, about this technology, is that it can happen automatically through policy. It can adjust to the varying demands. Even with a number of competing applications, you can see here that all the way on the left-hand side is our, our florist application that's running where IOPS are up, and over on the right-hand side is the test and dev. Its IOPS are down because it just didn't need them. Hopefully now you've been able to see and understand what data virtualization is, the power of data virtualization, and how it will transform uh, the data center. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time.